Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Soon, now, you'll join those ranks of dead, or your ashes the wind will soon blow. Family and friends will shed few tears, pretend it's off to heaven you go. But the reality is, you are just bones and meat, and with your brain died also your soul. Your face framed in dark curls like a portrait, the sun shone through highlights of red. What colour, I wonder, and how straight it will turn plastered back with the sweat of your blood. Your wet lips were a promise of a secret unspoken, nervous laugh as it burst like a pulse of blood from your throat. There will be no more laughter here. I feel your body tense up, my hand now on your shoulder, your eyes. Forget the lady called luck. She does not abide near me, for her powers don't extend to those who are dead. Hello and welcome back to another I Could Murder podcast, episode number nine of series four. I'm Tom Norris, and if you're listening to this, be sure to go over to YouTube, because the fella sitting next to me on the left is wearing a very interesting shirt. It is Ben Carter. Yeah, well, last week we spent some time all over Southeast Asia, and I thought I'd come back with a little souvenir. Um, and, and here she is. Uh, here it is. Because audio-wise, that would have... Sounded very questionable. <laughs> it sounds questionable. It looks questionable. How are you, then? <laughs> I really like it, to be fair. I'm, I'm, I'm rating it. That's cool. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I say it's interesting. So, yeah. No, very well. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. And um, I like your shirt, too. Okay I, okay. I said yours was interesting. I know. Oh. So, if you guys, if you want to support us and so Ben can buy more of these interesting, fascinating shirts, mm-hmm. we have a Patreon page and we do lots of minisodes on there and you can vote for the episodes on there and it only works out about a quid a week. That's it. And there's a 40 episodes on there right now, uh, both available in video and audio format. And um, yeah, there's some, some big, big cases we've done recently as well. Very big, big cases, Ben. You want to tell them about the big some cases? Some big, big cases indeed. So the Scissor Sisters, the Oklahoma. <laughs> ben, that's a band. In Oklahoma, that's a musical. <laughs> The mystery of D.B. Cooper, the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. And recently we did the Munich Massacre. Yeah, yeah. And and very recently, 44 Days of Hell, Junko Furuta. As well as Patreon, we also have a store, which is ICMAP, which is I-C-M-A-P dot store. And we're actually in talks now, trying to figure out some very special new additions to Mm -hmm. the store, which you're going to love. Don't just take his word for it. You're going to love it. (laughs) And as well, socials, we have Instagram, we have Twitter, both are at Could Murder a Pod, and we also have a Facebook page. We do, so we've which got is you covered. slightly different, but if you yeah. search like a murder podcast, it will just it will pop up. Yeah. And if they all go down, Twitter's usually still standing, so if Top- this is still relevant. It's topical. Yeah. Yeah. That fuel shortage, huh? I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm on Mock the Week. <laughs> mock the shirt. No, Mock the Week. Um, and- <laughs> Don't Mock the Shirt! <laughs> Isn't that very clear? <laughs> And we're very excited to do episode number 11 of the series where we forgot to pick the episode again for the Halloween special and you guys have picked it and we can't wait to delve into that. Yeah, so be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already because that episode is just a fortnight away. So this week's case, Tom, this is one that we both wanted to cover for quite some time. And for me, the standout is that it's a case that should be massive in terms of how recent it was, the the stuff that this individual got up to, but it seems to be one where you get a 50-50 response. Some people have heard of it and, you know, very shocked by it. Other people don't know who he is and I think it's, there's a weird balance. People seem to know this case a lot from the interrogation mm-hmm. footage, which is very, well, there's hours upon hours of it and a lot of the time he is just <laughs> being very frustrating, but... There, when he does actually speak and kind of lets things out, he's very arrogant. He kind of talks about things very blasé. 
Um, he's playing games with the officers. Yeah. So that's been studied quite a lot by people. And, it, and that's kind of, I think that's where I first saw it, was seeing clips of that. Yeah. And that kind of got me very interested in the case and then did a little bit of research into it. And I was like, yeah, we need, we need to cover this on the pod. 100%. So if you didn't know already, now you know, it's the case of Israel Keys. So very surprised to learn that Israel Keys doesn't have a, a, a nickname. So we've come up with one of our own, the Kill Kit Killer, which is rolls off the tongue. KKK. But it, it makes sense in this case. I mean, he's a very calculated guy, a very meticulous guy. He's a guy that we, me and Tom have been asked this a couple times by friends and also on some other podcasts that we've been on. How would you get away with murder or how would you commit the perfect murder? And I think in terms of the cases we've covered, what are we on now? Episode 30, 33? Something like that. He is possibly one of the smartest we've covered most sophisticated killers that we've covered he, so far he didn't ha- we'll get into it he, d- he didn't hand himself in or anything like that so we have some of them we've done before have kind of just walked mm. in and done that so he did he does make some errors along the way yeah so, um, some sloppy, but yeah, sloppy errors at the end but he's very very calculated as you say yeah 30, 30 odd episodes if it was a Royal Rumble in wrestling terms he'd be he'd, he'd, my money would be on him making it to the last three for a Disney reference Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs he'd probably be Doc you could just pick any kind of smart person from any Disney film, couldn't you? Um, who's smart from Disney? Um, the wizard from Georgia. Um, it's pretty good. Sword in the Stone. Clever. The owl from Winnie the Pooh. So we're going to delve into the childhood of Israel Keys now and see if there's any kind of red flags when he's growing up and see how he turned into the Kill Kit Killer. Israel Keys was born on the 7th of January 1978 in Richmond, which is in Utah. I've done it again. Utah. 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 Israel Keyes was born on the 7th of January 1978 in Richmond, Utah. He was born into a large Mormon family and was the second of 10 children belonging to Heidi and John Jeffrey Keyes. So the parents had a strong mistrust to the government as well as modern medicine and yeah, as well as being very fundamentalist Mormons and he was homeschooled along with his siblings. And when Keyes was a toddler, his family decided to leave Utah and go for Washington where they lived in isolated existence in the woods. Um, and whilst living in the woods, his father was building a big log cabin for all of them they the 10 siblings the mother and the father would live in a tent interestingly when keys was born as well um he had no social security number and no birth certificate i don't know how rare that is is that a rare thing who knows i don't know he also grew up without heat or electricity it's a lot of things he went without birth certificate heat social social security (laughs) (laughs) and uh, electricity so waste not want not That doesn't make any sense. In a a way. (laughs) Keyes spent a large part of his childhood living in a tent with his family uh, whilst his father would go on to build the family a cabin in the woods. While this was happening, his mother would homeschool uh, him, uh, Keyes, as well as the other children. So around this time, they attended a Christian identity church called The Ark, and this was known for its racism and anti-Semitism. Keyes would describe this church as being very Amish and more of a militar sort of church when he was a teenager. So, you know, very strict, very close-minded with their kind of rules. During this time, they would earn their money from cash and hand jobs, like cutting firewood or working on farms. And... um, Keys got very um, into hunting in the woods and he said he would hunt anything that, that had a heartbeat. Yeah, and when, when we decided we were going to cover this case, I obviously kind of knew, as you, as you mentioned at the start of the episode, you either are familiar with the interrogation footage or there's that surveillance footage of him going on to do something that we'll discuss later in, in the episode. But I was convinced, right, there's got to have been something in his childhood that really, you know... Well, it's not a normal upbringing with 10 siblings and growing up in a tent no electricity in mm. a kind of very strict religious religion tends to be a key theme in a lot of these crimes growing up in a household with very strict beliefs it progressed later on when it was there in washington keys parents left the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and became fundamentalist christians and joined a white supremacist church mm. so but there's no bang to the head no abuse no bullying still growing up in in a in a society which, which hates other people mm. Mowgli did all right did he grow up in a society that hates other people? Lots of, lots of violence. Lots of violence. Yeah, the uh, vultures mainly. And as Tom mentioned, he obviously learned to hunt at a very early age. But whilst living in the woods, Keys developed a, a bit of a passion for basically finding a nice spot in the woods. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> basically finding a nice. <laughs> Just looking at what your shirt looks like in the monitor, Karen. Thank you very much. That's just, again, when, I, when someone states a fact, it's not, it doesn't always mean a compliment. 
earlier on producer Dan said your, your arms are long he said thank you very much it doesn't mean it's a good thing that's right, it's fucking funny. No. <laughs> <laughs> they are long. You'd be a nightmare on a roller coaster. Yeah. Because of the smell. Um, the bit in the go bit in the woods? You trying to fart? No. <laughs> you trying to fart? I can see you tensing your little butt. Oh, you were, weren't It's you? not been a good minute for me. You really were trying. Yeah. No, I've got a, a bit like lightheaded. <laughs> So he'd find various spots in the woods, sit down, and he would remain perfectly still for hours upon end, um, just watching people. Um, and that was something he would regularly do. Which it's like is creepy meditation. Yeah, in a way. Creaky, if it was no. by a creek. In the late 1990s, the family relocated to Morpin, Oregon. And then the next moved across the country, settling to an Amish community in Maine. So I know we mentioned there weren't too many alarm bells around the childhood, but at a very young age, Keyes would start breaking into neighbours' properties, stealing valuables, money and weapons, and subsequently he would then set fire to the properties he'd just burgled. And again, for someone that's in their kind of formative years, we saw it a little bit with the Casanova killer, um, but he, he just thieved. But perhaps that related to kind of stalking out the area, sitting still and watching people go about their daily lives, maybe from the woods, we don't know. Key by name, breaking into houses. Maybe there's something in that. He also got into the habit of shooting BB guns at houses and he would start collecting these guns and hiding them in a cache at his family home. And when his parents found out, they made him apologise and returned the guns. Mm. That's a red flag. Problem solved. No, Ben. Trust me. Have you not done the research? In his teenage years, he renounced the Christian faith, which led to his father growing distant with him, but his mother remained close. At the age of 14, uh, Keyes would allegedly start torturing animals, including neighbourhood pets. So he would take cats and dogs into the woods um, and, and torture them. So Keyes, obviously involved in animal torture at a very young age, he would later go on to say, I've known since the age of 14 that there were things that I thought were normal and that were okay, that nobody else seemed to think were normal and okay. So whilst Keyes' family lived in Washington, he became neighbours and childhood friends with the brothers Kehoe, who had been convicted of attempted murders as well as murder later on. So the Kehoe brothers, yeah, that's a whole completely different kettle of fish that we won't get into today but feel free to google them because it's an interesting case as i said he denounced uh, the christian faith and he got into satanism as well during this time so killing animals into satanism creepy meditation robbing guns lots of red flags yeah there are now definitely loads of red flags you said there's none i said uh, look the, the early years we're now in kind of teenage territory and uh, i take it all back please do Take it all back. So obviously now we, um, we've we gone through his childhood, we've gone through his teenage years, we're now going to go into our timeline. Summer 1997. Keyes was working in Oregon near the Deschutes River. The river was a popular place for tubing. Groups of young people would often take their rings down to the river throughout the summer. One day Keyes stood on the beachy bank of the river, saw a sandy-haired girl between 14 and 18 years old, slightly separated from a group. He waded into the river and grabbed her, pulling her onto the bank and towards the bathroom. Once in the bathroom, he tied the girl up with ropes and raped her, planning to strangle and dump her body in the toilet pit where she wouldn't be found for a while. Keyes had also brought with him knives. Throughout the assault, the girl kept talking to Keyes, saying that she wasn't going to tell anybody and that she wouldn't go to the police. He told her to shut up and she kept talking. It worked. It prevented Keyes getting even more violent with her, even going as far as to tell him that she would have dated him if he had asked her and he was a good looking guy. This is his first kind of escalation in terms of, you know, obviously he was killing animals before and torturing animals. This is his, him finding his first human victim. And Keyes apparently would spend the next few years regretting his decision not to kill her. Yeah, Because he let the victim go, who obviously <clears throat> has seen him. There may have been more assault victims before this, but this is his first kind of sexual assault that he counted as he tied her up and he did intend to kill her. Yeah, and there was a very interesting quote from Keyes um, once in custody uh, about this particular event, recalling it. He would later tell investigators that he planned on killing her, but at the last minute decided against it, saying, I wasn't violent enough. I made up my mind and I was never going to let that happen again. So July... 1998. Now 20 years old, Keyes took a high school equivalency test and joined the army. The survival skills aspect of the training appealed to him. During his time in the army, he was stationed for six months in Egypt, where he and his friends took trips to Tel Aviv to visit sex workers. It was during this time that he decided to act on his fantasies of killing. After a few years in the army, Keyes was stationed at Fort Lewis, which is south of Seattle. It was here that he met a woman from the Maca Reservation in Nia Bay in Washington State. When he left the army in the summer of 2001, she was pregnant. He decided to move in with her on the reservation and gained work in the Parks and Recreation Department for the Tribal Authority. 
Summer 2001, Keyes killed his first victim in Near Bay, where he was living with his wife and newborn daughter. After a few months, Keyes killed a couple, his second and third victims. There's not a lot of detail here on these victims, as we'll get on to when he was actually being interrogated. He was very loose with information. He kind of used that as a bargaining tool in certain instances. So he didn't go over these uh, killings in much detail. So between 2005 and 2006, Keyes committed two other murders in Washington state, dumping one of the bodies in Crescent Lake. He and his daughter's mother had broken up and he began dating a new woman. When his girlfriend moved to Anchorage around 2007, he decided to follow her bringing his daughter along. So he has custody there, I'm guessing. So I read about this. Apparently he met, he was settled and in a relationship with the mother of his child, but he began on the side um, internet dating. So he'd met, met her on an online dating site and he'd basically decided, right, I'm going to up sticks, leave the mother of my child and go to Anchorage. Pull up his anchor and then go on to Anchorage. Uh, 9th of April 2009, Keyes travels to New Jersey and abducts and kills a woman. He crosses state lines to bring her into New York State. Her remains were not found, however, it is thought that she is buried in Constable, New York. As her body was never found, her, her identity has never been confirmed. However, Deborah Fieldman was a 49-year-old woman who was last seen on April 8, 2009 at her home in Hackensack, New Jersey. Yes, I believe they've kind of joined the dots together here and, and they assume that she's the victim there. He also, at this stage, um, he got into the habit of robbing banks, mm. which even though obviously robbing banks still definitely does happen. It just seems like such an old school crime to commit. Mm -hmm. 2009 and getting away with it. Yeah, and he would wear disguises, um, and completely fearless in his approach. He wouldn't he wouldn't um, hire other people to help him. He would do it all on himself. And and for the most part, well, for all, all of the attempts we're aware of, he got away with it. Yeah, so he robbed a bank on 11th of April 2009 in Tupper Lake, New York. Keyes threatened people in the bank with a handgun, although there was no injuries. He is known to have robbed multiple banks, some coinciding with the areas he may have travelled to kill. Around this time, he also burgled a Texas home and set it on fire. And there's uh, flights that he booked around this time, which correlates with those crimes as well. Keys here, give me the keys. When he was holding them up. And they said, who are you? And he said, keys, give me the keys. Cut that bit, see. <laughs> 2011, Keys camped out in a park near Anchorage. He planned to shoot a couple sitting in their car. His plans were ruined when a police officer pulled into the parking lot. Keys almost shot the officer, but chose not to when another police officer showed up. Keys also staked out the North Fork Trailhead in Eagle River, Alaska, with the intention of abducting someone. He prepared a kill kit up the road containing drain cleaner and a shovel for which he intended to use for disposing of the body. He apparently never went back to this location. So this is the first mention of the kill kits. So basically these were buckets which would contain ropes, guns, Drano, which is the drain cleaner, which he'd use, which he'd douse over the, the hands and the faces, kind of just to kind of remove any kind of uh, signs of him being there. And yeah, he would have these kill kits, which he'd dotted all around the kind of country, yeah. where he would just, you know, if he wanted to travel to this location and have this kit ready to kill someone, yeah. It was ready. We don't know exactly how many, but he would have them in different locations across different states in the country. But some of them would be buried two up to two years in advance before he'd even go back to that that location. And it just seems he'd he'd scope out sites before ever deciding on his victims. And even then, they were at random. It was just that they happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it is believed that there's still some of those kill kits out there. And along with that, it kind of makes people theorise perhaps there were more people that he had killed. Doing it because it, it was so sporadic and random. There's no clear pattern to his behaviour. 8th of June 2011, Keyes flew into Chicago and drove to Essex, Vermont. He had hidden a kill kit there two years prior containing Drano, ropes and a gun. After staking out a few houses, he decided to target the home of Bill and Lorraine Curia an animal hospital technician and medical practice worker. For no reason other than the design of the house, it had an attached garage and that would be easy to enter and the fact that they looked like an older couple with no children or pets in the house. So obviously no dogs, not going to make a lot of noise, or kids, maybe there's a bit of a moral play there, maybe he is, you know, not because he is a father himself. That's it, yeah, so since the birth of his daughter, he said he would not claim any children as victims, and he had a really peculiar list that he started going by in that it had to have a house with an attached garage, no car in the drive, in that there was no way to escape. No pets, no no dogs that are gonna make any noises, and no small children because he had a small child himself. And also no young mothers, because that reminded him of his partner. 
That evening, Keys cut the phone lines, knowing that most alarm systems are linked to them, then sat and waited for two hours whilst the couple went to bed, similar to his wood creepy meditations. Once he had entered through the garage, he was in their bedroom in less than a minute, wasted no time in waking the couple, threatening them with a gun and making them put on slippers in order to walk out to their car, which he used to drive them to an abandoned farmhouse. Keys then bound Lorraine with rope and left her, whilst taking her husband Bill downstairs where he began bludgeoning him taking pleasure in the violent beating. All the while, Bill was calling out and asking Keyes where his wife was, which is just, that's just heartbreaking. Keyes would stop in the middle of the assault to smoke a cigar in the backyard. Later returning to the house, he found that Lorraine had managed to escape her ties. He wrestled with her, raping and then strangling her to death. Keyes then went down to the basement where Bill was screaming for his wife. Keyes then shot him. Keys then poured the Drano onto the bodies before packing them into bags and burying them in the cellar. So in the following days, Keys would go fishing, um, ensuring he had the legal documents to go fishing so he didn't wouldn't cause any kind of uh, hassle for himself as so people may be looking into him. Also and, the perfect alibi. So he, he often would do things which were seemed very posery, kind of like the cigar in the middle of the, the whole attack, mm. going fishing afterwards, being very relaxed afterwards. It, it, Unless he just felt so at ease with this whole thing, it, is, it, is, it seems very kind of odd behaviour. And as well, this is obviously is his account on it. Yeah. So maybe oh, he, exactly. maybe he's flexing to the the cops a bit about going for a cigar and this is how I did it. Yeah. Then I did this. Then I did that. So the first of February, twenty twelve, Keys had selected Common Grounds Coffee Stand in the, in his hometown of Anchorage, Alaska, as the site of his next crime. After considering other coffee stands, the location suited Keys, and the late opening hours meant that it was likely his victim would be alone at the end of their shift. So this coffee house was very like, isolated and kind of out of the way. And yet, if if he was in, in there with no one else, it, you know there wouldn't be anyone for a big distance to kind of intervene. Just before closing time, around 7.55, Keyes approached a stand wearing a ski mask and ordered a coffee. As this was Alaska, that wasn't unusual. Samantha Koenig happened to be on shift that evening. She accepted his order and made the coffee, handing it over to him before he pulled out a gun and demanded money. So this is the very infamous uh, surveillance footage that, that, that you may have seen before if, you've, if you're familiar with the case. The, the part that I find, well, I find all of this completely chilling, but the particular part that is absolutely awful is the way that the external security camera is kind of framed to the external of the, the coffee stand is um, you can see quite a distance ahead and you can see his silhouette slowly getting closer and closer and closer and he's very calmly walking up to the to the building it's just yeah absolutely absolutely hideous so samantha immediately hands over the money keys then jumps over the counter and forces his way into the coffee stand and ties samantha's hands with zip ties and um, at this point he'd also uh, made her turn all the lights out in the building as well Keyes asked where her car was and she told him that she did not have a vehicle. Keyes then walks her at gunpoint out of the coffee stand and makes the decision to break one of his only rules. He decides to put her in his own car. On the way, Samantha managed to break free and tried to run. Keyes chased and tackled her down to the ground. He grabbed her again, pointing the gun at her body and telling her that she needed to cooperate and that she shouldn't do anything that would make him kill her. They walked back to the car park where Keyes' pre-prepared white truck was parked. He took the license plates off and removed the mounted toolboxes. Keyes then bound Samantha, put her in the truck and drove away. Obviously a very thought out uh, attack. He's obviously made one slight error in that he, he wasn't watching her for long enough to know whether she had her own vehicle or yep. not. He then makes the decision that he's going to take her in her own car. At this point, Samantha's boyfriend arrived at the coffee stand a little while later to pick her up. He found the stand empty. He then went to Samantha's house to tell her dad, James Koenig. So whilst this was happening, Keyes drove Samantha around town, telling her that this was a kidnapping and that he was only looking for a ransom. Samantha explained that her family didn't have a lot of money, but Keyes knew there was a chance that the family would enlist the public's help to raise the funds. He convinced Samantha that she wouldn't be harmed and would be returned to her family once the ransom had been paid. Believing Keyes, Samantha tried to talk him into letting her go, like the, his first victim, but sadly it didn't work out quite that way. However, Keyes had a plan, which involved using Samantha's phone to send the ransom message. Upon realising that the phone was left back at the coffee stand, he returned to retrieve it, leaving Samantha bound in the trunk, which seems like a yeah, very big risk. risk. Yeah. yeah, 
He's usually quite meticulous, but yeah, here, two errors here. He's re retrieved the phone and he sent two text messages from Samantha's phone. The first to her boyfriend saying that she was going out of town for the weekend. The second to the owner of the coffee stand saying the same and took the battery out of the phone just to stop it from being tracked. Samantha's boyfriend knew immediately that it wasn't her texting. Um, Keys then asked Samantha for her debit card. However, she shared a bank account with her boyfriend and his card was in the truck that they shared back at the house. Keys, already on the way back to his own house, asked Samantha for a pin number drove the rest of the way home and bound and put her in the shed in front in the front of his house which had, he'd already prepared with tarp and covered the area and had heaters on in there he turned up the radio and told her that no one would hear us if she screamed and that he had a police scanner so he would know if she tried to alert the neighbors his girlfriend and daughter were in the house at the time keys left the shed and drove to samantha's house he broke into her truck and retrieved the debit card which again is very very risky while he was at Samantha's, he was confronted by her boyfriend, who yelled at him, and then went back into the house to get help. Keyes ran back to his truck and left the area, driving to an ATM to test the PIN number. So Keyes would then return to the shed, where he would sexually assault Samantha before strangling her, leaving her in the shed before returning to his girlfriend and his daughter inside the house. The next day, he left on a two-week cruise with his family from New Orleans. Meanwhile, James Koenig, Samantha's dad, appears on TV offering a $12,500 reward donated by friends and family for any information about the abduction. In an interview, he says, please send my daughter home. I will give you anything in this world. Her boyfriend is also interviewed saying, this isn't Samantha's nature. She's a good hearted girl. This doesn't need to be happening to her. So we need to find her as soon as possible. The police and volunteers brave sub-freezing temperatures in the search for Samantha. The longer we go without knowing where Samantha is, the more difficult the case becomes, said a lieutenant in the Anchorage Police Department. So one thing I, I read about this as well is that in all of Anchorage at the time, there was 320 police officers and all 320 of them were working on this case at the time and they'd also enlisted the FBI to come over and support. Yeah. So it wasn't, although yes, there's there's crime in Alaska, absolutely, there was nothing like like, um, like this at the time, it basically caused an un, uh, unprecedented amount of, uh, you know, boots to the ground in trying to search her and the hope was that they would find her alive. And if it's a ransom, the likelihood is that, you know, the money would exchange and she'd be she'd be sent home fine. So 17th of February 2012, Keyes returned to Anchorage from his cruise. He began preparing the ransom note. He also went into the shed to retrieve Samantha's body. In other reports, I've read, I've read that he, he would go on to have sex with a frozen body because obviously it was in a shed. So Keyes had a plan where he was going to take a Polaroid of her to prove that she was still alive in order to kind of get this ransom note. To do this, he wanted to take a picture of her holding a newspaper to demonstrate that she's still alive and obviously the date of the newspaper being on it. But obviously she had, she's been dead for two weeks now. Apparently he was quite surprised by how much her body had deteriorated in this time. So he had to use other utensils to make her seem more seem more alive. So he, he, used, he bought makeup, he applied makeup onto her braid did the hair which apparently was a thing that he used to do for his daughters and he sewed her eyes open and he took a polaroid of her alongside a newspaper from february 13th 2012 he then photocopied the photo and then using a manual typewriter which he purchased typed a ransom note demanding thirty thousand dollars on the back of the photocopy he then placed this note on a notice board in connor's bog park under a memorial flyer of a dog named albert he sent a text from samantha's phone to her boyfriend saying connor park sign under pick of albert ain't she purdy so him mocking kind of her there and like teasing the boyfriend there. And all the while the family and the boyfriend are hoping she's still alive. Yeah, we're seeing that it's picture. Just... They probably saw that picture for as a relief yeah. thinking that. So her boyfriend told the police straight away uh, who then discovered the note. At some point in the days that followed, Keyes dismembered Samantha's body and drove out to Matanuska Lake where he cut a hole in the ice and dropped her body in. Meanwhile, Samantha's dad deposited the ransom money raised by friends, family and members of the community into Samantha's account in the hope the police would be able to track the withdrawals. So we then go to the 28th, 29th and 30th of February 2012. Keyes withdraws the maximum $500 from Samantha's account each day at different ATMs across Anchorage, each time wearing some kind of mask. He uses it a total of eight times moving across different states. Authorities were able to determine that the perpetrator of these withdrawals was driving a white Ford Focus, but were unable to see his license plate. So the following month, the 11th of March 2012, Keyes attends the wedding of his sister in Wells, Texas, at which he causes a bit of a scene. It's kind of been circulated, perhaps he's unraveling here, perhaps from the guilt of the, the crimes he's been committing, because this is actually the first time he's reached out to his family for the first time in years, and he's, he's not his usual calm demeanor here. So they're kind of people thinking 
something was playing on his mind. During this visit, a sister tried to get him to reconsider his atheism. A pastor present at the time has said that Keyes answered, you don't know the depths of the darkness that I've gone to. You don't know what I've done. So yeah, at this time, Keyes feeling very uneased. Unkeasy. Yeah, a bit queasy, Keyesy. 13th of March 2012, Keyes is arrested after a Texas Highway Patrol officer pulls over a white Ford Focus matching the description of a car being used for the illegal ATM withdrawals. The policeman used the excuse that he was travelling a couple of miles over the speed limit in order to not cause suspicion from Keyes. Initially, he is arrested for access device fraud after finding Samantha's debit card in his wallet and her phone in the boot of his car. So, so the police are immediately suspicious to have, to have found the belongings of a missing person um, in, in Keyes' car. So they now have the right to detain him and they kind of, uh, to keep him calm, explain that they thought he was speeding. So the police would also find in the car a kill kit in the back and also a bank notes which were covered in ink from a bank robbery. Sometimes the, the money's rigged with the kind of ink device to kind of stain the cash if it's yeah. been stolen. So um, yeah, that was found on his person when the police arrested him. So from April to October 2012, Keyes was interviewed voluntarily 24 times in the seven months after his arrest. In his first interview, he requested an Americano, a Snickers and a cigar in exchange for telling the investigators where Samantha's body was. And on the 2nd of April, Samantha's body was actually found. He also told investigators that the Koenig murder was one of many. He was increasingly concerned about his name being kept out of the media, explaining he lived two lives, one the murderous killing spree and one as a father and boyfriend. He didn't want his daughter or his family to find out about his crimes which I find we said before he's quite it, like we'll go I guess I'm going to go into a bit more detail later on um, that apparently is yeah it's high average he's intelligent but these kind of things I find it baffling the fact that he doesn't quite understand how his name is going to get out there yeah. like you kind of said at the begin, beginning of this his name isn't as out there as maybe you expect and they did with kind of withhold his name for quite a while during this case Yeah, but still it's like thinking your daughter and your family are going to know what happened to you yeah and if I tell you some more information you're just going to keep it between us aren't you yeah it's mad yeah. so he made a deal he would tell the investigators about his crimes in exchange for his details being kept out of the press and various other petty demands he teased that he had killed about a dozen people along with other crimes such as arson. April 2012, Keyes agreed to a six and a half hour evaluation by a psychologist. It was meant to determine whether Keyes was sane enough to make legal decisions for himself. It found that Keyes was not only sane, but at the high average end of the intelligence spectrum. However, he was found to have antisocial tendencies. So with that, perhaps just thinking, you know, he grew up in the kind of environment he grew up in, sometimes lack of electricity, Perhaps he did live a very sheltered life. He did mention it, comparing it to Amish communities before. Yeah. So maybe he just wasn't aware how the media worked and how things came out and how it, how interactions with police actually was. I know growing up, he, well, he, he said, would say in these interviews he always idolised Bundy. Yeah. And kind of how random Bundy was with the killings and how he kind of went from state to state causing mayhem. But yeah, I don't know if this is a, a lack of knowledge or he thinks he's so powerful he can kind of make his demands i don't really know he's very socially awkward i mean there's loads of uh, interrogation footage available online and the, there's there's one that i don't know if it is this actual uh, evaluation i don't think it is because i'm sure it's police interrogation but it's also just over six hours long and i haven't watched the whole thing but for a six and a half hour long piece of footage the amount of laughter and the different variations of his laughter. Like there's there's a really sinister laugh. He has quite a creepy laugh. He's got all the laughs, Tom, is what I'm trying to say. But it's he's he's not timing it and it's just he, it's not mirrored by the police at all. It's just very uncomfortable. I viewing. think the police are trying to schmooze him a bit. They are kind of being a bit like chatting and friendly with him because they are spending that much time together. Not because they consider him a friend, but they, I think they think this is how we're going to get things out of him if we're actually impressed with the way he is and we know we kind of blow a bit of smoke. Um, so in May 2012, Keyes attempted to escape during a routine hearing. Keyes broke his leg irons and jumped over the railing, but was tasered and recaptured quickly. So he actually makes a joke about this um, when, he's, when he's being interrogated, basically saying like, hey, I tried to escape, but it's not like you guys would have trusted me as a character before. I killed people. So it's like me escaping is not going to change your opinion on me. Keyes continuously asked for the death penalty, wanting to know his execution date in exchange for further information about his victims. After confessing to Samantha's murder and giving details about the couriers, Keyes was reluctant to part with any information about his other victims. He would go on to say to the investigators, the things I've done, I don't feel bad about them. I did them for myself. 
It's better for me to keep them to myself. They are mine. That's why we didn't have much more information about the, the previous killings, mm -hmm. because he didn't actually impart the information. In order to get some answers, agents slid photos of missing people in front of him, and Keyes would respond, nope, 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 at a glance. Then once when Feldman's image came up, he hesitated and waited, and then said only, I don't want to talk about her yet. It's the yet. So he's got yeah. absolute control of this situation. And yeah, he's he's in some of the interrogation footage as well. He's very laid back, very smug, knowing he has yeah, all the art. He's you know, yawning. Yeah. He's, yeah. So Keyes would also tell investigators about kits of potential body disposal tools he had hidden in Anchorage along the bank of Eagle River. They found it based on Keyes' directions. This was one of many kill kits Keyes had hidden across the country. Keyes would go on to say, I only left that stuff there because I was planning on using it eventually. I don't like to litter. So yeah, so he was claiming he would be, you know, intentionally leave them there. The word eventually is hideous in that one. And so far, only two have been found. Uh, and these ones that were found contained a shovel and bottles of Drano, as well as material for concealing a body and speeding up decomposition. Over the months, Keyes eventually developed a kind of intimacy with his interrogators, going on to say, you guys know more about me now than anyone. His name still hadn't been released at this time to the media. So the police, to an extent, were holding up their end of the bargain in exchange to get more information from him. They're probably making him feel like, you know, this isn't going to, you know, if you can keep telling us, you can keep helping us find these people, find these kill kits, you know, we'll keep your name out of the press. Summer 2012, Keyes was identified by a Vermont television station as a suspect in the murder of the couriers. He became so angry that he stopped speaking to the investigators for two months. October 2012, the agents told Keyes they were losing patience and senior officials believed he was playing them. So the FBI said to him, the ground is freezing Israel. If you want to be involved in helping us, it was 18 degrees outside yesterday. We don't have a lot of time to play with and it is a long, cold winter. So the 29th of November 2012, Keyes spoke to interviewers again, agreeing to speak about things unrelated to Samantha Koenig, agreeing to show through Google Maps the locations of his kill kits. So Keyes has changed his tune slightly and although he hasn't outright given any more information to the police, he's given them kind of assurances that he'll show them more information in later date. The 2nd of December 2012, Keyes slit his wrists and strangled himself with a bedding in his cell at the Cook Inlet pre-trial facility. He left a four-page long suicide note, which has been dubbed an ode to murder. And we're going to ask producer Dan to read that now. You may have been free. You loved living your lie. Fate had its own scheme. Crushed like a bug, you still die. Soon, now, you'll join those ranks of dead, or your ashes the wind will soon blow. Family and friends will shed few tears. Pretend it's off to heaven you go. But the reality is you are just bones and meat, and with your brain, died also your soul. Send the dying to wait for their death in the comfort of retirement homes. Quickly say it's for the best. It's best for you, so their fate you will not know. Turn a blind eye back to the screen. Soak in your reality shows. Stand in front of your mirror and you preen in a plastic castle you call home. I looked in your eyes. They were so dark, warm and trusting. As though you had not a worry or care. The more guileless the game, the better potential to fill up those pools with your fear. Your face framed in dark curls like a portrait. The sun shone through highlights of red. What colour, I wonder, and how straight it will turn plastered back with the sweat of your blood. Your wet lips were a promise of a secret unspoken, nervous laugh as it burst like a pulse of blood from your throat. There will be no more laughter here. I feel your body tense up. My hand now on your shoulder, your eyes. Forget the lady called Luck, she does not abide near me, for her powers don't extend to those who are dead. He's written it in a very kind of pretentious, wordy way. It's been speculated whether there's some clues in there, but yeah. there's not been anything that's, nothing's come out of it so far to actually point to any kind of, um, any, you know, other bodies or any uh, other victims. Yeah, and so much of Keyes' blood poured onto the suicide note as well that they had to take it straight away to be kind of salvaged um, at various, you know. Pour a bit of drain on it. Uh, apparently as well, the reason he, he slit his wrist, but he wanted to just double to make sure he was, he was going to die. So he tied his legs up. So when, and a noose around his neck. So when he's, he would lose the blood and lose, um, being able to stand to strength, he would force himself to be strangled just to, just to ensure that he definitely was dead. So again, completely on his own terms. 
So following this, the assistant US attorney leading the prosecution delivered this statement to the media. It gives us no pleasure to dismiss the charges against Mr. Keyes, but that's what the law requires. So it's kind of, it, it's it's shades of uh, David Parker Ray here in the, again, a potential serial killer never to be charged of serial killing. The investigation into other potential victims would remain open and still remains open to this day, though um, Israel Keyes has, has never been formally charged with any of the murders. Yeah, so and um, he was very conscious, like we said, about you know his family hearing about him and hearing about what, how he actually was. But um, obviously now he's, he's gone down in infamy here. So that's, that's the end of the timeline. And I'm going to go into a bit more kind of de other details around him. Apparently he wasn't very picky about his victims. He said he liked them to be lightweight because they're easier to dispose. And apparently after he became a father, he tried to avoid situations that might end with him hurting a child. It's been speculated that perhaps the in Washington State, Lake Crescent was a dumping ground for Keys. And one of the FBI agents basically speculated because apparently uh, Keys had a boat. He'd often go on these lakes. And apparently he, he said that one of the victims was dumped within this lake. Mm -hmm. So Again, um, David Parker Ray, Elephant Butte Lake. Stinks of David Parker Ray. Obviously with, with uh, Keys, he's got the kill kits dotted over the state. David Parker Ray has his toy box, but no one knows obviously the extent of what's inside there. He's going further afield to get his victims and bring them to the toy box, whereas Keys is kind of going to look. There are, there are similarities. So Keys admitted to studying the tactics of other serial killers, but was careful to point out that he used his own ideas. And he added that after murdering, he liked to return to Alaska and then follow the news of his murders on the internet. So he was clued up on the internet. Yeah, I think the one thing that separates Keys to a lot of these serial killers is, unlike most serial killers, he, he didn't want to be in the spotlight, mm -hmm. which... Until like, he was there. He then seemed to be milking it a bit in the interrogation, but then he would, I guess, at the time, be under the guise that, this, although this is being filmed, this is not going to be made. I think he, was, he enjoyed showing off to the people within the room. Yeah perhaps not understanding how far that could kind of stretch out. And if, if he really wanted to go down, like, in infamy, he would have said all the kills he ever did. Yeah. But perhaps there weren't as many as people think. Well, well that's, it. that's what he wanted. We're going entirely off of his side of events. And although, yes, we've we've said how, um, how meticulous he was and how uh, composed and well-planning, we're still only going off of his word. No bodies have been found, although that you know there's essentially such in I think half the states in America. Well, that's the kind of thing now. Is obviously the way he, he treated the bodies, you know, dousing them with Drano yeah. and whatnot. A lot of these cold cases will not be solved, and they could well be, you know, the, the victims of his crimes, which you know, is very sad. And on that, Keys would usually kill far from home, and he never returned to the same area twice. On his murder trips, as he would refer to them, he kept his mobile phone turned off and paid for items in cash only. He had no connection to any of his victims, and for the courier murders in particular, Keys actually flew to Chicago, where he then rented a car to drive over a thousand miles to their home in Vermont. So it's really kind of scattered all around. I mean, yeah. he would even go as far as to be careful with the money he used to pay for these trips. So he, he did have a construction business, but he wouldn't use any of the money he earned from that on these trips. He'd only use the money he received from Robin Banks. Keyes actually studied and idolised Ted Bundy, but he gave no credit to Bundy, claiming that all of, all of his ideas were his own and that he considered himself to be a legendary serial killer. Keyes would also go on to comment on Dennis Rader, BTK, stating that he was a wimp for showing remorse for his crimes. And as we said, a lot of this is speculation, not really knowing exactly um, how many victims he had, but one quite interesting thing, which I think is, it'd be odd if it was a random number, but he, he used his own blood to draw 12 skulls in his uh, prison cell, um, which uh, people have speculated perhaps the 12th skull was him after he killed himself, and the other 11 represents the victims. Yeah, so it's alleged there's either 12 skulls or 11 skulls and one pentagram. One of these particular drawings included the phrase, we are one, written at the bottom. The FBI believes that the number of skulls correlates with what are believed to be the total number of victims. So three could be evidenced at trial, I believe. They think it's up to 11, the FBI believes it could be, but other people and a lot of the, the research in preparing for this case suggested the number 32. Um, based on kill kits, timings, locations. Yeah, but they haven't found all the kill kits. So That's I think it, kill kits yeah. are kind of hard to go by. Um, yeah. This is quite amusing, the fact that he would have hated us doing this. He's apparently said, this, the more stuff my name is attached to, the more likely it is somebody's going to try and do some stupid true crime bullshit. So there you go. I'm sure he would appreciate this. And apparently when asked by investigators why he committed his crimes, he simply replied, why not? 
I think the the most unbelievable thing about all of this, just on what you've just said there, why not? It all, although the planning is massive and meticulous, I'll say it again, meticulous. He's been the whole time. That's the word of the episode, I think. It's and Andreno completely at random in terms of his victims and the people that happen to be in those areas all across the country, the wrong place at the wrong time. And it's just there's no there's no clear motive whatsoever. Maybe power, maybe financial in some aspects, but other than that, a little random one here for you, Ben. I know you're a big fan of names. Love names, yeah, good ones. That's some of his siblings' names. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sunshine Keys, Autumn Rose Keys, Hosanna Keys, Charity Keys, and um, God. Richard Keys. It was just banter. <laughs> Gar- Garage Keys. The Magic Keys. Um... That's all there is. Between the years of 2006 and 2008, Keyes travelled to Mexico and visited a plastic surgeon clinic. Um, and he would get dental work, a gastric band and laser hair removal. And he also had wow. his fingerprints modified. So apparently the police would, would basically speak to some of the people he was in the army with and compare, they kind of ask him what he looked like before, just to kind of see if maybe he could link into other crimes before that. And apparently when he was in the army, he, he stood between 6'2 and 6'4, was built like a rock, 230 pounds of muscle and have a huge nose. So they, they thought maybe he had this surgery to make him a lot less distinctive. I mean, he still looks fairly, in his mugshot, he still looked in fairly good health, like he'd, you know, just spent well, some time in the band. Army. So 230 yeah. pounds, so I guess, but they say he's a big ball of muscle, so. Yeah. Unless he just can't stop eating protein and protein shakes. Potentially. I mean, he also had a time in... in <laughs> Let's not rule it out. Smooth that off, with yeah. potentially. Um, but he also, for a period of time, uh, owned and ran his own um, construction business, Keys Construction, working as a handyman, contractor, decorator, and construction worker. So he'd also had some time in the army. He, he looked in fairly decent condition when he was arrested, and obviously he he still it wasn't just going for women. Um, he was going for for he had male victims as well. He went for couples at the same time. It was just so indiscriminate. Uh, but that is a, a bizarre fact about the the plastic surgery yeah gastric band on keys and even to this day apparently there's someone paying his defense lawyer to retain legal counsel and it's been rumored to possibly be his girlfriend my final fact on it before we go into a lookalike it's ben yeah he loved limp biscuit wow wow i also heard that he was a big fan of uh the insane clown posse so big into that kind of metal rap scene Looky likeies. Yeah. So now it's time for a looky likeies. I've got two this week. Two, Both okay. For keys, obviously. Don't know. Yep. Uh, so first one, uh, uh, mugshot arrested. Said he looked in fairly good shape. Keys, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not appalled, but I'm not amazed. Okay, that's progress. Like that. mm. Do you want my second and, and, and one? Mm. Do you know, I've got two photos here, Dan. That... Mm. Okay. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You're too soft on these, Dan. Mm. The X one. <laughs> and my second one, which is more of a stretch, actually, keys with long hair. I don't know why. I get a little bit of DJ Qualls, um, who's the guy from Road Trip. The guy that has the uh, yeah. French toast. French toast. Yeah. Special French toast. You're all right this week, to be fair. Thank you, Dan. That, well, don't give me that look, Tom. No, don't I, worry about his I'm look. Fi- I'm fine with that one. I think that was all right. But the Thank Mark Zuckerberg you. one, I think, is a terrible shout. Uh, um, terrible is the wrong word. I okay. Think. Yeah, uh, bad. Not bad. Bad. Not bad. Just a bit bad. Wow. So this one here, Ben, this picture here, which will pop up. Yep. A bit like a weedy rub of Zlatan Ibrahimovic. That's poor. That's not good. I think it's better um, than Zuckerberg. No, it's not. Let us know in the comments section, guys. Weedy Zlatan or less buff Zuckerberg. You didn't say that. Okay. I, I said he looked buff there and Zuckerberg isn't buff. Buff sounds like a compliment. I think Zuckerberg's won this one, Tom. We'll put them up and guys, let us know in the comments below who you think is correct. Or who do you think is close because I think they're both bad shouts. I also think this picture, Ben, actually, paint in blue, it looks a bit like an avatar. That so, should have been your thing. Mm, okay, well, that's yeah, my thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Painting in blue with the banks that he robbed using keys, Israel keys, the blue device in the money bag, splatters, you have got an avatar. Or a member of the Blue Man Group. I don't know where you're going with that, but that does make sense. Yeah, yeah. good. Scenic route. Anyway, guys, uh, that is the end of today's episode. That is the case of Israel Keys, the Kill Kit Killer. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, 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 the Kill Kit, yeah. 
Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Do you want to say what I said again? <laughs> no. Thank you so much, guys. That brings us now to three episodes remaining of Series 4. Uh, two of the cases, obviously, uh, pre-prepared. The other one voted by you guys over on our Instagram page. So thank you so much for considering to give us a follow on there. We really appreciate it. And we can't wait to see what you picked. We just can't. As well as that, if you can't wait until next week, we have got a Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash could, m- could murder a pod. You done me. <laughs> You bugger. We also have a Patreon page and there's over 40 episodes over there. Audio and video versions. You can find us on patreon.com forward slash could murder a pod. We also have an Instagram page, Twitter page, which is at could murder a pod. We also have a Facebook page and all you need to search is I could murder a podcast. (laughs) That would have been good with the effects. I don't know. Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> it's funny and we also have a store which is icmap.store and where you can buy hats mugs stickers as well as toads and also things coming soon there you go fantastic I gave myself chills did you I did chill kit and anyway, guys, like we always say... We say this all the time. We actually do. We, we've every s- episode now. We've nearly said it over a hundred times. Nah. Nearly. The amount of times we've got it wrong. Yeah, we, yeah we've said it over a hundred times. Keep doing what you're doing. Unless... Uh, you're hiding kill kits all over the country. Yeah. Um, living in the well, you can live in the woods if you want me- to. Creepy meditation. Uh, yes, yes. Don't do creepy meditation. And um, Drano, too much Drano. See you later, guys. Bye bye. Till next time.